The following video updates my previous analysis of the May 31 tornado event and the storm chasers that it impacted. We'll take a look at more detailed and refined tornado and storm chaser tracks and unlike the previous video I'll make some suggestions on how dangerous maneuvering in and around this storm could have been avoided. On May 31 both the general public and storm chasers made a mass exodus south out of Oklahoma City. For many this was the most dangerous and worst possible choice they could have made. We'll take a look at some lessons and safety learned from this event from both the perspective of the general public and from storm chasers. Using detailed measurements from mobile radar, the National Weather Service office in Norman, Oklahoma released a more detailed and precise track of the El Reno tornado. Most of the information on the tornado's position and width that is used in this video comes courtesy Gabe Garfield of the Norman NWS who provided detailed timings and positions for the tornado's location. Based on mobile radar measurements of the wind speeds within the tornado, a preliminary rating of EF5 was assigned to the largest tornado of the May 31 event. However, current policy at the Weather Service dictates that a tornado must be rated on the damage that it creates, not from radar measured wind speeds. The wind speeds are then inferred from the damage. Despite the radar measuring winds well in excess of the 200 mile an hour EF5 threshold, these winds were confined to smaller subvortices orbiting within the larger parent tornado. These subvortices stayed mostly over open terrain, impacting few structures. Thus, there was not enough damage to link the measured winds to the inferred wind speeds of the enhanced Fujita scale. Based on the greatest amount of damage found, the tornado's rating was changed to an EF3. Had this tornado impacted a densely populated area at its strongest, it would have likely been rated higher, and debate continues as to whether radar measurements should be included when rating tornadoes. Despite the rating downgrade, the El Reno tornado is still officially listed as the widest tornado on record, with a maximum width of 2.6 miles. Courtesy Gabe Garfield, there are several other really interesting observations that were made from the mobile radar data. The tornado reached a top speed of 55 miles an hour. While not a record, this is exceptionally fast for a tornado, making it exceptionally dangerous as well. The subvortices orbiting inside of the two mile wide parent circulation were as large as average sized tornadoes, having widths of several hundred yards. Some of these subvortices were moving at speeds in excess of 100 miles an hour, and some estimates place wind speeds inside of them approaching 300 miles an hour. As in the previous video, we'll look at the level 2 base reflectivity from the Oklahoma City radar. The tornado path, center, and size are estimations based off the mobile radar measurements. Storm chaser positions are plotted in green. We'll also take a look at four groups of storm chasers that were impacted by this tornado. These four are plotted in red. Please note that other groups of storm chasers were impacted by this tornado. Some passed through the circulation without incident, some received damage to vehicles, and one of them was killed. I don't have detailed information on their circumstances, however, so this video will not go into detail for these cases. In total, the El Reno EF3 resulted in eight fatalities. This animation provides an overview of the storm and storm chaser movements around it. Much of this remains unchanged since the previous video, so we'll focus on the mass exodus of southbound traffic out of Oklahoma City that occurred. Well after the El Reno tornado had developed, and when it appeared that it was moving toward populated areas, local media urged that residents in the path of this tornado should get out of its way by heading south away from the storm. This was interpreted by many as a mass evacuation order, and thousands took to the streets and their cars as a result, no doubt further encouraged to leave after witnessing the damage and fatalities that had occurred with the Moore EF5 only 11 days earlier. Few residents in the Oklahoma City area have basements or safe rooms, so the idea of evacuating seemed like the safest option given the alternative of riding out a violent tornado above ground. If residents could simply drive a few miles south, they'd be out of harm's way. There was a huge problem with this thinking, however. When everyone tries to evacuate at once, the roads turn into a huge traffic jam. With some having only a few minutes to get out of the way before the storm hit, the simple act of driving a few miles became impossible, as thousands were trapped in gridlock traffic. Additionally, the Canadian River also acted as a huge bottleneck for evacuating traffic. There are a limited number of highways that cross this river southwest of Oklahoma City. Southbound traffic came to a standstill at every crossing, including US 81, Route 4, and Interstates 44, 35, and 240. After the El Reno tornado dissipated, a storm complex with embedded supercells moved southeast across the Oklahoma City area. Every ensnarled river crossing was in the path of one of these tornado-worn supercells. Luckily, these embedded circulations did not produce tornadoes as they crossed these highways. These supercells did produce several other weaker tornadoes, however, and most were south of the large EF3. 
Residents attempting to flee south from the Yukon area risked crossing the path of an EF2 tornado, and those heading south out of the Oklahoma City metro area would cross the paths of several EF0 and EF1 tornadoes. This scene best captures the danger and scale of the southbound evacuation. Courtesy Hugh Scott, here's a photo of Route 4, a four-lane divided highway that crosses the Canadian River south of Mustang, Oklahoma. Here you can see the southbound lanes are completely gridlocked, as another gridlocked road merges in from the east. In their desperation to get south, many evacuating drivers began to drive the wrong way down the northbound lanes, until that side of the highway also became completely ensnarled. This location was in the path of a tornado-worn supercell at the time. Had one of these supercells produced a strong or violent tornado that impacted and snarled evacuating traffic, the death toll from this event would have likely been much higher. Alternatively, had a strong or violent tornado impacted a populated area during this event, it would have been much safer to shelter inside a sturdy building, even if you're still above ground, than it would be to get caught by a tornado in your vehicle. 100% of the fatalities directly attributed to the El Reno EF3 occurred in vehicles. While this is mainly the result of the tornado staying over open country, and half of these fatalities were storm chasers, it's important to recognize the extreme danger of being caught in your car during a tornado. While these animations make it seem like the roads are cluttered with storm chasers and that they're a major source of the traffic problem, it's important to note that the few dozen chasers on this event made up a tiny fraction of the thousands heading south. The overwhelming majority of traffic was made up of evacuating residents. Here are a few points that residents should carefully consider when deciding whether or not to evacuate, and more specifically when the entire evacuation plan is to simply go south. First, are you going in the right direction or should you be heading north or some other direction? While it may seem obvious to head south when the storm is coming in from the north, many residents evacuating during this event, mainly those north of I-40, may have actually started north of the tornado's path. Fleeing south would force them to cross the tornado's path and put them at risk of being impacted by the tornado. For these residents, an escape to the north would have been the fastest route out of the tornado's path. Driving north would take you into the core of the storm, however, and this leads into the next point. Evacuating in a vehicle is not as easy as just taking a short drive down the road like you would on any average day. Blinding rain, large damaging hail, and high winds can make it impossible to see where you are going and bring your speed down to a crawl. Downed trees and power lines and flooded roads also pose deadly threats beyond the threat of the tornado. Drivers under large amounts of stress also face the risk of being unable to operate their own vehicle safely and are at risk from other drivers frantically trying to flee as well. As we saw in the animation, the supercell that produced the El Reno EF3 was only the lead cell in a line of supercells, and several other tornadoes were produced as well. The weather changes rapidly during tornado outbreaks. You could leave your shelter when there is a single cell, and minutes later new storms and tornadoes could develop along your escape route. Without the TV's live coverage showing you exactly where the tornado is, how will you know which way to go? Tornadoes often do not move in straight lines, but turn left, right, or even loop in full circles. If you flee in your vehicle, you may start out heading out of the tornado's path, but wind up back inside of it after the tornado makes an unexpected turn. Worse, you may have left safer shelter that's no longer in the path of the tornado, only to be caught in your vehicle instead. The El Reno EF3 made a significant turn to the left, part of the reason why so many storm chasers were caught inside of it. Finally, if you are caught in a tornado, your vehicle offers little protection. Tornadoes as weak as EF1s can roll a vehicle, and a violent tornado can turn a vehicle into an unrecognizable crumpled ball of steel. Here are a few safer suggestions for residents, and much of this information is the recommended advice from the National Weather Service. Don't take my word for it. Please visit the National Weather Service website for more info. Have a plan for what to do during a tornado. If you live in a mobile home or someplace without adequate shelter, it's important that you find a safe place to go before threatening weather ever occurs, and that you give yourself enough time to get there. A safe shelter might be a friend or neighbor who has a basement or reinforced safe room, or it could be a public building that is a designated tornado shelter. Give yourself ample time to get to shelter. It's often too late to get in your car and drive to shelter after a tornado warning has been issued, as you may only have minutes and encounter traffic and hazardous weather. It's extremely dangerous to get in your car and drive someplace once you are in the path of a tornado that is already in progress. This was the case for many on May 31. A tornado watch was issued at 3.30 p.m., two and a half hours before the EF3 developed. When the watch is issued and before storms form, this is the time when residents should make sure that they are within easy reach of shelter. You don't have to get in your shelter, but this would be the best time to visit somebody or some place with a shelter that you can use. When the tornado warning is issued, this is when you should get into the shelter, and you may only have minutes before the storm or tornado hits. 
It's important that you are within easy reach of shelter at this point and not caught in your vehicle. If you have to leave, make sure you know where you are going and have a plan for once you get there. Many residents fleeing south on May 31 did not know how far south they should go, when they were out of harm's way, or what to do during and after their evacuation. While I was chasing the storm, several residents stopped their cars and asked me where they should go and what they should do. They were acting only on the advice that they should go south. Have a shelter or someplace safe in mind before you start driving someplace, and if possible, tell someone where you are going. In this next animation, we'll take a closer look at the El Reno EF3 and focus on this event from a storm chasing perspective. The tornado developed at 6.03 p.m. and took on a southeast course initially, which set the stage for a chase where most were primarily focused on getting out of the way rather than pursuing the tornado. Many chasers who set up east or southeast, conventionally a safe location on a northeast moving storm and tornado, found themselves in the path with the need to get out of the way. The tornado changed course several times during its life, and this motion caught many unaware since the tornado was often rain-wrapped and its direction not readily apparent. As the tornado approached US-81, it became exponentially more dangerous to those in its path. The tornado accelerated to 55 miles an hour and doubled its size, expanding to over 2 miles in less than 1 minute. Those in the path at this point had only a fraction of the time available to escape than they did a few minutes prior. At US-81, the tornado also made a significant left turn. Due to low visibility, this change in course was not apparent to many chasers and put those who were chasing north of the tornado in mortal peril. As the tornado approached Interstate 40, its forward motion stalled and it actually did a small loop. The tornado was almost completely rain-wrapped at this point and a deadly, nearly invisible threat to those traveling along the interstate. One thing you may notice in this animation is that the tornado's center is often not in the center of the circle indicating its size. This circle is only a rough approximation of the tornado's size and shape at a given time, since the tornado was actually asymmetrical and had a complex shape due to the dynamic wind field that comprised it. The tornado dissipated at 6.43 p.m. Next, we'll take a look at several groups of storm chasers that were impacted by the El Reno tornado or its adjacent winds. The first group we'll look at includes Brandon Sullivan and Brett Wright. It may appear in this animation that they're cutting corners and driving cross country, but this is just error that results from the animation interpolating their position between missing data points. Their GPS track remains unchanged from the previous video, but what has changed significantly since the previous video is their position relative to the tornado's track. The updated path is further south than the original. This is significant since Sullivan and Wright went south to escape this tornado. Although the estimated damage path may make it seem like they were out of harm's way at their position before they decided to escape, they would have very likely still encountered damaging winds at this location, could not have known the details of the damage path at this point, and would have still needed to take their escape route. As they escaped south, Sullivan and Wright cleared the more intense inner circulation of the tornado, which was near the tornado's center point at this time. They were, however, caught by the expanding parent circulation and then likely by inflow jets and rear flanking downdrafts as they continued further south. Video of their escape can be viewed on YouTube and shows debris moving across the road, including a large hay bale which impacts their vehicle. With significant damage to their vehicle, Sullivan and Wright were able to eventually exit the storm to the south without injury. Here's an actual visual of the storm from our perspective. I've added some overlays to the video to show where chasers were relative to the tornado's center and outer circulation. Using our GPS position, the orientation and field of view of the camera, and the GPS positions of various objects and chasers, I can label where chasers and the tornado would be relative to our view, even when we couldn't actually see them. It's similar to how the first down line is drawn on the screen when you're watching a football game on TV. The tornado is often obscured by rain, so the overlays help indicate its position when it was otherwise not visible from our location. Additionally, the visible parts of the condensation funnel do not correlate with the actual size of the tornadic circulation. Damaging winds surround the tornado much further out than the funnel may suggest. The tornadic wind field is indicated by the red bars surrounding the tornado's center point and is an approximation based off the mobile radar data. In this view, you can see Sullivan and Wright's position relative to the tornado from our perspective. They are positioned in front of the tornado at this point, and you can see the tornado is tracking southeast, heavily obscured by rain from the high precipitation supercell. As they escape south, they are able to avoid the core of the tornado, keeping about four-tenths of a mile from its center point, but are overtaken by the parent tornado circulation and its damaging wind field.
Their view straight ahead at this time would show nondescript storm structure and precipitation underneath the rear flank of the supercell and debris moving across the road. The visible condensation funnel would be behind them and to their right. Here's a freeze frame from the video. A lightning strike backlit the tornado at this moment, which allows us to see the rain obscured condensation funnel much more easily. The tornado's center point is derived from the mobile radar data, so it's interesting to see how well this approximation lines up with the funnel we're seeing visually in the video. Also of interest is how far the damaging wind field extends from the funnel, and that the southern end extends much farther than the northern. While Sullivan and Wright are clear of the funnel at this point, they're well inside of the tornado's damaging wind field as indicated by the red bars, and are being impacted by debris moving across the road at this time. Traveling south, they still had to go a significant distance before they cleared the tornado. Sullivan and Wright started north of a southeast moving tornado. Had they chosen and promptly acted on an escape route that went north and did not cross the tornado's path, they could have entirely avoided being impacted by the tornado. Sullivan and Wright weren't the only chasers to race the tornado across its path. Numerous other chasers made very similar maneuvers. All four groups of chasers that we'll focus on in this video chose escape routes that crossed the tornado's path and did not take their escape route soon enough. These are critical errors when maneuvering under supercells and near tornadoes. The reasoning and context varied from chaser to chaser, but I'll make some suggestions on why chasers were choosing dangerous escape routes, as well as how they could have avoided these situations and pick safer alternatives. This is not meant to criticize the actions these chasers took since many of the details and lessons learned from this event were not apparent until after a detailed analysis of the event could be done. Instead, this video is meant to provide lessons in safety for storm chasers using this event as an example. Many storm chasers chose escape routes to the south on the May 31 event using US 81 or the adjacent road grid. While the vast majority of chasers took these escape routes without issue and with ample time, many were dangerously racing the tornado as they crossed its path and others managed to drive directly into the tornado, as if they were trying to do the exact opposite of escape the tornado. It seems that some chasers have been hardwired to always go south when picking escape routes. Looking at the supercell as a whole on radar, some chasers may see the entire supercell as a threat to safety, and when acting on their escape routes, feel that they have to clear the entire storm and get to clear air to the south. In this graphic, I've circled what chasers might consider the danger zone in red, and the safe zone in green. Chasers using this mentality would pick escape routes that take them on the shortest route out of the storm. Chasers located at the black arrows in this example would both head south, with chasers at the northern arrow perilously crossing the tornado's path. Here's a photograph of the El Reno supercell looking west. There's a tornado underneath the base, although it's not easily visible due to being rain wrapped. This photo might offer some insight as to why chasers are picking southbound escape routes based on their current visuals. Again, I've circled the danger zone in red and the safe zone in green from the perspective of a chaser who considers the entire storm to be the main threat. Chasers at the location labeled with the arrow attempting to get to clear air would take a south escape route. Relative to the storm, this arrow is located in the same spot as the northern black arrow we saw in the last radar frame, and this escape route crosses the tornado's path. Chasers who panic or immediately act on an escape route without considering which option is safest may blindly head for clear air, disregarding the dangers that lie along that path. Next we'll look at the GPS track of Mike Bettis and a crew from the Weather Channel. Bettis and crew started their chase north of the El Reno supercell and cut across its forward flank, heading south through the heaviest part of the storm's precipitation core to gain a view of the tornado in progress to their south. This maneuver is known as core punching. While many chasers engage in core punching, it's generally considered to be a dangerous maneuver. If the tornado is heavily rain wrapped, as the El Reno tornado was near the end of its life, it's possible to drive across the forward flank of the supercell and directly into the tornado, having never gained a visual on the tornado. Also, you lose your visual on the storm and tornado when driving through a town. Had the El Reno tornado turned left a couple minutes earlier, it's possible that Bettis and crew could have driven into the tornado's path while their view is blocked by trees and buildings. Bettis and crew were able to safely core punch the storm from the north and emerge in the inflow notch of the supercell south of El Reno. They set up for a live broadcast, stopping for a couple of minutes. During the broadcast, they determined that their current position was not safe and escape to the south was attempted. Unlike Sullivan and Wright, however, their location prior to acting on their escape route was largely clear of the tornado's path, and they did not clear the intense core circulation when heading south. 
Bettison Cruz track has been updated since the previous video. We know they made it almost to 15th Street, about a mile further south than the previous video showed. This location, combined with the updated tornado track, shows that they were extremely close to the tornado center point at the time of impact. Bettis and crew attempted to race the tornado before it crossed US-81, and in doing so wound up driving directly into the most intense part of the tornado's core. Their vehicle was lofted from the road and rolled several times, landing dozens of yards off the highway in a field. One member of their crew suffered serious injuries. Here's our view of the storm at the time Bettis and crew are making their south escape attempt. Bettis is southbound on US-81 at this time, and we are eastbound on 15th. The center of the tornado is just off the left side of the frame. The tornadic wind field extends well over two miles at this point, and you can see its northern extent is indicated by the red bars on the right. Bettison crew cross our field of view as they race south, crossing into the parent tornado circulation. They're able to keep driving at this point, encountering heavy rain and wind. Visually, the tornado is heavily obscured by rain without an easily discernible funnel. Many chasers at this point may have misjudged the tornado as simply rain, hail, and rear flanking downdraft wind. Without an easily visible funnel, they may have been unsure about which route was the safest. One really interesting thing to note at this time is our distance to the tornado's circulation. We are traveling east, directly away from the tornado at a decent speed. However, our distance to the tornado is rapidly dropping. This is when the tornado accelerated to 55 miles an hour, while also rapidly expanding in size. It's quite alarming to see the tornado gaining on us as we drive away from it but we're finally able to pull ahead from the tornado after it makes its left turn and we pick up more speed. Bettis and crew go off frame to the left just as they are impacted by the tornado. Their view at this time shows low visibility due to heavy rain. Large sub vortices, which look like more classic looking funnel clouds, are moving in the field to their west, and one of these sub vortices more than likely impacts their lead vehicle. We're going to take a closer look at the storm, and instead of looking at the entire supercell as a threat to a chaser's safety, we'll focus on the individual parts that are most dangerous. I've labeled the most hazardous parts of the supercell here. Storm chasers located at the positions indicated by the white arrows should take the escape routes in the directions these arrows indicate in order to avoid the most dangerous parts of the storm. You'll notice that I did not label the hail core or the severe winds of the forward flank in this diagram. Chasers heading north away from the tornado will likely encounter these hazards. While large hail can smash windows and cause significant body damage to your vehicle, hail is generally not considered a life-threatening hazard to chasers while they are in their vehicles. The tornado and its adjacent winds are life-threatening, however, so an escape route that leads into the hail core should be taken before an escape route that could encounter the tornado or its adjacent winds. Never cross the tornado's path when taking an escape route, even if you think you can make it in time. Always pick the escape route that takes you directly away from the tornado's path, even if that route takes you in a large hail and you can see clear air to your south. The tornado is not the only threat the chaser needs to consider when taking an escape route that goes from north to south across the rear flank of the supercell. The first region a chaser will encounter is often called the bear's cage, circled in black in the diagram. The bear's cage is the region underneath the mesocyclone and is often marked by spiraling rain bands. This region contains a tornado and wall cloud if there is one. Damaging winds can extend throughout the bear's cage, however, and satellite tornadoes can also form around its edge. Once inside of the bear's cage, heavy wind and rain can make it extremely difficult to maneuver and maintain speed, putting the chaser at extreme risk from being impacted by the tornado. Safety-minded chasers should not only avoid entering the bear's cage, but also stay out of its path. The bear's cage should be treated as if it is the tornado itself. Even if there is no apparent tornado, Anywhere within this region can be impacted by tornadic winds without warning. This view is looking west at the El Reno supercell and rain wrap tornado. The bear's cage fills the frame in this view. Notice how the rain bands are moving rapidly from left to right. This is a visual indicator of rapid rotation. This entire region should be treated as the tornado. Chasers in the path of the bear's cage, as I am here, should immediately act on an escape route that takes them directly away from the tornado. In this case, we went east to gain ground on the tornado before we had enough time to drop north or south out of the path. This is a view looking south at a supercell in northwest Iowa on October 4, as I travel east just north of the bear's cage. There is an EF4 tornado wrapped in rain on the right edge of the frame. The streaky bands of precipitation and the green core behind them mark the region of the bear's cage. Once overtaken by these spiraling bands of precipitation, escape from the bear's cage becomes much more difficult. As they were in a similar position relative to the storm, this is a view similar to what Tim Samaris and crew might have seen before they were overtaken by the bear's cage and then the El Reno tornado. Immediately south and west of the tornado, a focused jet of inflow often feeds directly into the tornado and is labeled in pink on the diagram. 
This inflow jet often appears as a long line of gray mist that can be just tens of feet wide and tall, while moving at speeds in excess of 100 miles an hour. Because of its appearance and motion, I like to refer to this inflow jet as the ghost train. Inflow jets can feed into the tornado from any direction, but they often extend furthest from the tornado in the region of the rear flanking downdraft to the south and west of the tornado, generally the area behind the tornado. Chasers in this position need to be extremely mindful of the ghost train as it has the potential to do tornadic damage. The winds within the jet often contain debris like small rocks, which can shatter the windows in a vehicle and cause serious injuries. Chasers focused on the condensation funnel and debris cloud of the tornado may not realize that they are still in the path of the ghost train, since its gray mists are less visible and much lower to the ground. Here's a view looking north from within the rear flanking core of a supercell in northeast Nebraska on October 4. The ghost train is the gray band of mist crossing the road up ahead and spirals back into an EF4 tornado. As the camera pans to the left, you can see the ghost train moving through the trees in the foreground and the large tornado it's feeding in the background. Chaser Adam Lucio was likely directly impacted by the inflow jet on this tornado as the rear window on his vehicle was shattered just south of the tornado. A similar jet likely impacted Dan Robinson just south of the El Reno tornado. In addition to also losing the rear window on his vehicle, Robinson was knocked to the ground and pelted with debris while standing outside his vehicle. The rear flanking downdraft, or RFD for short, wraps around the tornado and fans out south of the tornado. On a radar reflectivity scan, it's marked by a hook echo. In this diagram, the area west of the red line is within the rear flanking downdraft. This line is known as the rear flanking gust front. Damaging straight line winds can be found in the RFD along with blinding rain and damaging hail. RFD should be avoided since it has the potential to do damage, but also because it often obscures the tornado, wrapping the tornado in rain. Chasers caught in RFD have the potential to be hit by a tornado without ever seeing it. RFD is a significant component on almost every supercell and dominates the storm structure on a high precipitation supercell. Here's a high precipitation supercell that tracked through southwest Nebraska on June 19, 2011. This supercell did not produce a tornado. The RFD gust front is marked by the red line. Behind this line, damaging straight line winds, heavy rain, and damaging hail can be found, or potentially a rain wrapped tornado. Chasers at positions marked by the white arrows that need to take escape routes should head north if they are directly north of the RFD core, or east if they are northeast of the RFD core. Although the view to the north looks dark and foreboding, the region behind the red line is the most dangerous part of the storm. Finally, on the southern end of the supercell's rear flank, sometimes the RFD curls in a clockwise direction, opposite to the direction it curls on the northern end of the RFD gust front. The circulation may result in an anticyclonic tornado, meaning it spins clockwise, opposite of most northern hemisphere tornadoes. Anticyclonic tornadoes are generally smaller and less common than their cyclonic counterparts, but are still extremely dangerous. The El Reno supercell produced an anticyclonic EF2 tornado, just as the main EF3 was winding down. This tornado tracked southwest of the Yukon, Oklahoma area, and mobile radar detected that it had a multi-vortex structure. Storm chasers south of the main tornado should be alert for the possibility of anticyclonic satellite and flanking line tornadoes, all of which can sneak up on a chaser focused on the main tornado and catch them unaware. Here's our view of the El Reno tornado near the end of its life. The tornado can be seen as the purple shape in the background, fairly rain wrapped at this point. The lowering in the foreground is the region from which the anticyclonic tornado would develop. Here's the anticyclonic tornado in progress, marked by intermittent whirls of condensation at the ground and power flashes. Storm chasers need to be mindful of all these hazards when maneuvering underneath a supercell. Some chasers may elect to sacrifice some safety for the sake of getting into a better position on the tornado. For those that are most safety oriented and don't want to risk encountering life-threatening hazards, any location behind the red line should be avoided. The path and potential path of the most dangerous hazard should also be avoided when possible. I've marked this path with dashed black lines, which allow the tornado to veer some from its current course. Chasers that find themselves within these lines should take a couple moments to pick the safest escape route and then act on that escape route. I'll make some suggestions as to what makes a good escape route and when to take it. But first we'll take a look at Tim and Paul Samaris and Carl Young's chase route. Prior to the El Reno event, no storm chaser had ever been killed by a tornado they were chasing. 
Chasers have been killed by other road hazards driving to and from a chase, and the simple act of driving remains the most dangerous aspect of storm chasing. Tim Samaras and Carl Young are widely recognized amongst their colleagues as some of the most experienced and well-respected storm chasers in the field. That they are amongst the first to be killed by a tornado calls for the need for a serious look into how we chase tornadoes and what constitutes safe storm chasing. The need to understand what happened to Tim, Paul, and Carl and how it can be avoided by others is a major motivation for why I've put this video together. In the previous video analyzing this event, the only location information I had on the Twistex group came from Dan Robinson, who had a visual on their vehicle leading up to their final minutes. Since then, Carl Young's video camera was recovered from the wreck site and the video analyzed carefully by Gabe Garfield of the National Weather Service office in Norman. Gabe was able to piece together the route they took using visuals, dialogue, and timestamps from the video. The times and locations of Samaris and Young used in this video come courtesy Gabe Garfield's work with collaboration from Dan Robinson. Samaris and Young started their chase south of I-40 and maintained a position in the inflow notch of the supercell, staying just ahead of the precipitation in the Hook Echo and north of the Bears Cage, before moving in closer to the southeast moving tornado. Playing the inflow notch on a high precipitation supercell allows a view of rain-wrapped tornadoes that are otherwise hidden from other angles. This region is hazardous, however, since it often contains very large hail and severe winds, or pushes the chaser to get very close to the bear's cage in order to maintain their view. On Reno Road, the Twistex crew is positioned right on or just within the bear's cage. They parallel the tornado to its immediate north. At the intersection of Reformatory and Reno, the tornado makes a slight jog to the left, and more than likely realizing their proximity, the Twistex crew backs off, heading a mile north. They get within a tenth of a mile of the tornado's circulation before heading north, however. While noted for being intelligent, calm, and reserved, Tim Samaras often engaged in an extremely aggressive chase style and had a history of getting dangerously close to violent tornadoes. His positioning on the El Reno tornado immediately north of the tornado is not unlike several other intercepts he had done in the past. On May 22, 2010, in South Dakota, Samaras and crew were overtaken by a circulation underneath the tornado cyclone on a developing EF-4 but luckily missed being impacted by one of the more intense subvortices. On April 14, 2012, Samaras stopped only yards from the intense core of an EF-4. On both events, they were heading east, immediately north of the tornado. Approaching US-81, dialogue between Samaras and Young indicates that they are questioning whether or not to continue and that they may have had a loss of situational awareness. They decide to continue on, however, hoping to get ahead of the tornado heading east. A mile east of 81, dialogue indicates that they realize the tornado is moving on their position. More than likely, seeing clear air ahead and escape to the east was attempted. Already perched on the lip of a 2.6 mile wide tornado, however, there is no time to clear the path. They are quickly overtaken by the spiraling rain bands and high winds marking the perimeter of the bear's cage, and their forward speed is dramatically reduced. Carl's video ends at 6.20, so we don't know exactly what happened in their final moments within the vehicle. We do know that they were overtaken by the circulation underneath the tornado cyclone and then directly impacted by a much more intense subvortex within the core of the tornado. On Ruder Road, a quarter mile shy of Radio Road, between 622 and 623, the vehicle was thrown and rolled several times and all three occupants inside were killed. This is our view of the El Reno tornado looking west from 15th and Country Club just prior to us moving east to stay ahead of the storm and avoid being overtaken by the bear's cage and parent circulation. At this time, Samaris and crew are on the other side of the tornado, a little over a mile to our west and a mile to our north. The distance between them and the tornado decreases until they are almost kissing the outer edge of it before they head north a mile to put more space between them and the tornado. This is almost 10 minutes before they are impacted by the tornado. This next sequence shows the storm from our perspective during the time in which the Twistex crew is impacted by the tornado. The tornado does not have a well-defined condensation funnel at this point, but instead is a gigantic mass of rotating rain and wind with more intense subvortices located inside. These spiraling bands of rain that normally denote the edge of the bear's cage instead define the area of the tornado itself. The tornado has expanded in size to 2.6 miles and consumes most of the area shrouded in rain. This is why the bear's cage should be considered the tornado itself. Carl Young was driving at the time and his seatbelt was found to still be buckled at the wreck. This suggests that they were still trying to escape the tornado in their vehicle at the time of the impact. 
Their seats were also in the reclined position. This could be the result of the vehicle being rolled and having the seats forced down, but if done intentionally, it suggests that the three might have been attempting to shelter within the vehicle by getting below the window line. This is speculation based on what little details we know, however, and we may never know what happened exactly in their final moments. There are no good options when you are in a vehicle and cannot avoid being overtaken by the tornado. Your chances might be slightly better to leave the vehicle and lie flat in a low-lying area, such as a ditch, while covering your head with your arms. This is an absolute last resort, however. Storm chasers must plan ahead and go to lengths to ensure that they are never placed in this situation. This can be done by maintaining a good escape route and knowing when to take that escape route. When under or near a supercell, storm chasers should maintain escape routes at all times. It's not enough just to have an escape route, however. Chasers should carefully choose the safest escape route. Here are a few guidelines for picking safe escape routes. First, your escape route should lead directly away from the tornado or the tornado producing regions of the supercell. Avoiding life-threatening hazards is the goal of an escape route, and these routes should immediately put distance between you and the hazard. These example escape routes lead directly away from the tornado producing region of the El Reno supercell. Your escape route should never cross the path of a tornado or tornado producing region. These escape routes cross the path of the El Reno tornado and should be absolutely avoided. Your escape route should use major roads, not the narrow unpaved roads of the grid. Gravel and dirt roads are often significantly slower than paved roads. They might not even exist, even though your map says they do. This road plotted across El Reno Regional Airport on Google Maps does not exist. If your escape route relies on this road, you're in trouble. The best possible map will do you no good if your road is not traversable, however. Down trees, power lines, and flooding can block your road. Dirt and gravel roads are much more likely to be impassable since they are not as well maintained. Dirt roads should not even be considered if they are wet or it has started to rain. You should assume that roads on the grid that you haven't just traveled down are blocked. Unknown roads on the grid should not be used for escape routes unless you have no other alternatives. Assuming that your road lies along a safe route, the best road you can use for an escape route is often the road you just came down, since you know its current condition. Your escape route should take you to a safe location where you are clear of the most hazardous regions of the supercell. This is not necessarily where the sun is shining and clear skies are overhead. Remember that the goal of the escape route is to put distance between you and the hazard and clear the path of that hazard. Chasers should not focus on getting to clear air, but avoiding the hazard. Knowing when to take your escape route is just as important as having one. Storm chasers should take their escape routes when any of the following conditions are met. If your safety is in jeopardy in any way, you should take your escape route. There are any number of things that can compromise your safety. If you are uncomfortable with your current position on the storm, if the winds become severe enough to cause damage or injuries, if you feel that you could become boxed in at a dangerous location due to a lack of road options or too much traffic, don't wait until these issues become problems. Act on your escape route as soon as you detect something is wrong or you feel uncomfortable with your situation. As soon as you recognize that you are in the path of a tornado or a tornado producing region such as the bear's cage, you should act on your escape route. How do you know if you are in the path? Take a few moments to watch the tornado's motion. If the tornado is moving from left to right, the tornado should pass to your right. If the tornado is moving from right to left, the tornado should pass to your left. If the tornado has no apparent motion, you are in the path and should take your escape route. This tornado was moving from our south to north and passed to our north. We were safe to film from this location. This tornado has no apparent left or right motion. We were in the path at this time and acted on our escape route. In this case we went south, back the way we came, and then to an east paved highway to avoid not only the tornado and bear's cage region, but the accompanying RFD as well. Several groups of chasers who chose to stay ahead of the storm using the unpaved road grid discovered that their unpaved road abruptly ended, even though their maps said it went through. Their only road option was back the way they came, and that route was occupied by a tornado, which was coming down the same road. With no other alternatives, the line of chasers was forced to attempt an escape cross country by leaving the road and driving across a field. They became stuck in the mud and luckily missed impacts from several tornadoes that passed nearby. 
Never rely on a single unpaved road as both your only means to stay ahead of the storm and your only escape route. If that road is impassable, you are out of options. If you are surprised by a tornado, stay calm. You've got a few moments, so take a deep breath and look to see which way the tornado is moving. The last thing you want to do is panic and accidentally race into the tornado in your haste to get out of its way. If there is no tornado, treat the tornado producing region of the storm, the bear's cage, or the rear flanking gust front as the tornado. Determine which direction it is moving and clear its path if you are inside that path. If you don't know where the tornado producing part of the storm is, take your escape route away from the storm. This leads into the next point. Where am I? Where is the tornado or tornado producing region? Where am I relative to the tornado or tornado producing region? If you answered I don't know to any of these questions, you have lost your situational awareness and should take your escape route. If you can no longer see the tornado or the storm structure indicating where the tornado would be, perhaps due to heavy precipitation, terrain and trees, or nightfall, you should take your escape route. If you become disorientated and don't know where you are relative to these features, you should also take your escape route. The key is to maintain an escape route as you chase, so that if you do become disorientated, you aren't completely lost as to how to get out. Chasers should be ever mindful of their way out when maneuvering under and near supercells. Dan Robinson also started his chase within the inflow notch of the El Reno supercell and initially parallels the tornado to the north, about two miles north of Tim Samaris and crew. Chasers sometimes approach supercells from the west, cutting through the precipitation of the hook in an attempt to gain a view of the tornado. This maneuver is known as hook slicing and is extremely dangerous, since it can easily result in blindly driving into the back of a tornado. Robinson avoids slicing the hook by starting his chase ahead of the hook and maintaining his position within the inflow notch. This positioning potentially put him at risk of crossing the tornado's path later on, however. Dan Robinson turns south on Choctaw, moving in for a closer view of the tornado. Turning east on Reuter, his path converges with Samaris and crews, as their vehicle comes in just behind Robinson's as they travel east. Dan stops at US-81 and pauses briefly to consider his options, before deciding to maintain his position north of the tornado by heading east. Continuing east on Reuter, Robinson is unaware of the tornado's left turn until he spots the spiraling rain bands of the bear's cage approaching his position from the south and beginning to cross the road. The tornado circulation now almost entirely consumes the bear's cage, and at this point entering it means being impacted by the tornado. Robinson, seeing clear air ahead, begins an escape to the east. Behind him, Tim Samaris and crew are having trouble keeping pace and fall behind. As they are further engulfed by the wind and precipitation of the bear's cage, the Twistex crew falls further and further behind until their headlights are no longer visible in Robinson's rear-facing camera and disappear entirely behind a solid wall of rain and wind. Robinson barely escapes being impacted by the more intense core of the tornado and its subvortices, but was overtaken by the broader parent circulation. Severe winds and rain within the outer circulation make it extremely difficult for him to maintain speed and traction on the unpaved road, however. Robinson reported having the accelerator floored, but could only manage 40 miles an hour on the road under those conditions. Once clear of the condensation funnel, Robinson stopped twice to film the tornado crossing the road behind him as it moved to the northeast. While clear of the funnel and intense core of the tornado, the updated path of the El Reno tornado indicates that he was still within the outer circulation and damage path of the tornado when he exits the vehicle to film. With little warning, Robinson is then impacted by what was more than likely a powerful rear inflow jet. The back window on his vehicle is shattered and Robinson is knocked to the ground and blown across the road while being pelted with debris. Although these winds are outside of the funnel, in terms of the damage path they are still considered to be inside the tornado. Robinson suffered injuries, but he's able to get back into his vehicle and escape south, heading through the rear flanking downdraft. This sequence shows Robinson's position relative to the tornado from our perspective and is the first time we had a high contrast view where the tornado exhibited a well-defined condensation funnel that was not heavily rain-wrapped. At this time, Robinson has just escaped the intense core and subvortices of the El Reno tornado and is outside his vehicle filming the condensation funnel, which is more than a mile wide, with several distinct subvortices orbiting around its southern edge. Moments later, Robinson is impacted by the ghost train, which was not visible from our position, and then he makes his escape south, eventually clearing the parent circulation. Finally, I'll make a few suggestions on some safer alternative escape routes these four groups of chasers could have made that would have prevented them from being impacted by the tornado. 
Brandon Sullivan and Brett Wright gave themselves enough time to clear the subvortices and cone-shaped condensation funnel they were filming. However, the bear's cage and circulation of the tornado cyclone was rapidly expanding to over a mile and a half in diameter, and they did not have enough time to clear these hazards heading south. Additionally, their position midway down an unpaved road left them only the options to go north and south. Stopping near an intersection would have allowed for an east escape option, which would have also led directly away from the tornado. Sullivan and Wright raced the tornado heading south, dangerously crossing the tornado's path. Once clear of the tornado, they would have still had to clear the bear's cage, inflow jets, rear flanking downdraft, and possible anti-cyclonic tornado on the southern end of the hook. These hazards spanned a length of almost four miles, a distance that Sullivan and Wright would have had to have cleared in about a minute. With careful observation of the direction the tornado was moving, an escape route to the north would have taken them directly away from the tornado, and they would have been well clear of the path after only a mile of travel. They may have encountered large damaging hail along this route, but would have missed the life-threatening hazards to the south. With careful observation of the direction the tornado was moving, Mike Bettis and crew could have also picked a safer escape route. Noting that they are north of an east-moving tornado, an escape to the north would have taken them directly away from the tornado's path. This was their best option for escape. If they needed additional distance to clear the path of the tornado after its left turn, west on I-40 could have also been a good option. This would place them back into the hail core, but take them well out of the tornado's path, and also away from the paths of circulations and training supercells. The worst possible escape route in this case would have been to the south, since this route crosses the tornado's path and ultimately led directly into the tornado. After the tornado's left turn, an east escape would have also been extremely dangerous, as this too crosses the tornado's path. East escapes on the grid also used unreliable and unpaved roads. Tim Samaras and Carl Young adopted a very aggressive chase style due to their desire to place scientific probes in the path of tornadoes. The proximity at which they pursued violent tornadoes left very little room for error. Coming up to US-81, the Twistex crew may have had their first cues that it was time to take an escape route, and they were also presented with their best option for escape. Dialogue between Samaris and Young indicates that they are unsure of whether the area to their south is just rain, contains a tornado, or where that tornado is. Unsure of the current state of the storm or the tornado's position due to low visibility suggests that Samaris and Young lost their situational awareness. This was their first cue that it was time to take their escape route. On the northern lip of the bear's cage, a region that spanned well over two and a half miles at this point, the best direction leading directly away from this tornado producing region of the storm would have been to the north. Additionally, US-81 provided an excellent north escape route as it had four paved lanes allowing for a high rate of speed at which to escape and the capacity to handle some traffic. At this moment, the Twistex crew also considered the possibility of holding their position and letting the storm pass. As the core of the tornado was already starting to cross US-81 and move away from them, this option would have kept them out of the path and also given them more time to consider their options. It's important that chasers take the time to carefully consider what their best course of action is instead of hastily acting on an escape route that might be incredibly dangerous. Although their best escape route at this point was heading north, due west, back the way they came was also an option. With the tornado moving away from them, heading west would have quickly taken them away from the tornado. They also know the condition of that escape route, since it was the way they came and they were on that stretch of road only moments ago. Instead, the crew decided to continue east, which maintained their position perilously close to the tornado. They were presented with another cue and one last opportunity for escape as they approached Alpha Dale Road, however. Tim Samaris acknowledges verbally that they are in a dangerous location, which suggests that he noted the left turn of the tornado and that they are now in the path. It was absolutely critical that this realization was made before they crossed Alpha Dale, and that they then used Alpha Dale as their escape route to head directly away from the tornado. This was their last opportunity for escape, as the intersection of Alpha Dale and Reuter marked the point of no return. Continuing east on Reuter, an impact with the tornado was unavoidable, given their proximity to the tornado at this point. We may never know exactly why they committed to an east escape route. Perhaps they were still hoping to get ahead of the tornado to deploy probes. Perhaps they thought they could make it to clear air to the east, or that the bear's cage region posed less of a threat than it did. The El Reno tornado was exceptional in its size, but not in its behavior. Storm chasers should be prepared for tornadoes that change directions, including turns to the left, which are common when large tornadoes occlude. Bear's cage regions spanning multiple miles are not uncommon on large, high precipitation supercells as well. It's imperative that storm chasers give these regions a wide berth so that they are not caught in the path when storms make a turn. 
Chasers must also be dedicated at recognizing the critical warning signs that they need to take an escape route, such as a loss of situational awareness or the realization that they are in the path. The same escape route strategies that apply to the Twist X crew could have also been used by Dan Robinson, who was extremely fortunate to have escaped the core of the tornado by heading east on Ruder. Cautious chasers may elect to back off from the storm sum or take their escape routes when presented the option of continuing in close proximity to a tornado producing region on a road like Ruder. Since the road is unpaved, its use is more hazardous, giving the chaser less margin of error if they need to escape. Additionally, Ruder comes to a T after 4 miles. Chasers are then forced to go either north or south, and this limiting of options can be dangerous. It should also be pointed out that unpaved roads which come to a T or dead end after a few miles are often less maintained than roads on the grid that continue for many miles. These short roads are often the ones most likely to be complete mud or marred with deep tractor ruts and potholes. In this diagram, the rear flanking gust front is marked by the red line. After being impacted by the ghost train, the orange arrow indicates Robinson's only escape route, which crosses hazardous regions of the hook. An important lesson to take away from Robinson's encounter with the El Reno tornado is that storm chasers should not become overly focused on the condensation funnel, but also recognize the hazards adjacent to the tornado. Instead of stopping to film, continuing east and then south, Robinson might have avoided his encounter with the ghost train, or rear inflow jet, and saved himself from injuries and damage to his vehicle. Forced to go south when Ruder came to a T, Robinson was also forced to cross the length of the hook and all of its associated hazards, including the rear flanking downdraft and anticyclonic tornado, which was just getting started at this time. Here's a wide angle time lapse of the El Reno supercell with rain wrapped tornado, taking during the first 10 minutes of the tornado's life. The clear air to the south looks safe and serene. But one of the most important lessons for storm chasers to take away from this event is to carefully consider which route is actually the safest. Your best route away from the tornado might just be into the darkest, most ominous looking part of the storm. For residents, one of the most important lessons from this event is that you should be ready to get into your shelter long before you see a site like this. This concludes the narrated part of this presentation. I'd like to thank everyone who pitched in data, video, and stills to make this production possible. Please feel free to email me or comment below if you have any questions or comments. The remaining portion of this video is our shot of the El Reno tornado in its entirety in real time with audio and overlays of tornado and chaser positions.
warm and still. Is it going to hit Reno? Holy cow! Am I getting this? and a cyclonic funnel right in front of us.
Yeah, I don't know. Okay. Well, is that we got condensation coming down over there? I think it was hard to be, uh... We have a lot of movement right here, guys. Look at this. It's left to right. Um, oh, yeah, look at that. Look at that. Are we going to be safer? Are you sure? We're safe. For now, yeah. We're south of the circulation. It's pretty wide. Yeah, this is surging out, and that thing is just spinning in there. It almost stopped. It's almost safe. Is that on you? You're pretty. That's positive. That's on the ground. I can't. I don't know how it's not. Well, I mean, I'm not positive, but I thought I. It's I mean, it looks like. I, mean, I haven't seen any power flash. No, neither have I. There's a CC hole in, on, on the fuel hole that has to be on the ground. Okay, I'm going to report that as a wedge then. I can hear it churning. Is that thunder or is that tornado? Where's the keyboard? Has you have you seen it? It's a, it was in the back seat. Oh, it got squished. Oh, here it got wedged. Well, once it gets populated, we're just going to have to go around it. 